Good morning. Thank you so much for tuning in to Sunday School this morning. I'm so glad that you're here. Um, I really enjoyed uh, these last few weeks being able to share uh, the book of Isaiah with you. Um, thank you so much for joining us to study God's Word and to uh, listen to what He has to say to us. And um, so let's just go ahead and jump in. Uh, today's lesson is in Isaiah chapter 31. We're going to be looking at verses 1 through 9. Isaiah 31. And the lesson's entitled, God Protects. And the main idea is that God is able to protect His people from enemies. And that is such a reassuring and comforting thought. Um, let's go ahead and look at our first set of scripture because I want to give you some background on it. But uh, let's go ahead and look at verses 1 through 3. The, uh, this section of scripture is entitled False Hope. And it's Isaiah 31 verses 1 through 3. Woe to them that go down to Egypt for help. And stay on horses and trust in chariots, because they are many. And in horsemen, because they are very strong. But they look not unto the Holy One of Israel, neither seek the Lord. Yet he also is wise, and will bring evil, and will not call back his words, but will arise against the house of the evildoers, and against the help of them that work iniquity. Now the Egyptians are men, and not God, and their horses flesh, and not spirit. When the Lord shall stretch out his hand, both he that helpeth shall fall, and he that is hoping shall fall down, and they shall all fail together. Well, let me give you some background. I, if uh, you've been watching all these lessons, this is going to be a little bit of a review. But if uh, this is the first time watching, then uh, I want to catch you up. So um, the background is the people of the Jewish people, the 12 tribes of Israel, are in a period of their history where they're divided. There's the northern nation of Israel and the southern nation of Judah. And so you've got two separate countries, Israel to the north and Judah to the south. And uh, they have their own kings, two separate countries, although they are all the Jewish people. And so at this time, the dominant world power is Assyria. And they are ruthless. They are violent. They have no regard for life. They are a fearful uh, or a terribly uh, fearful people. They are people to be feared, the Assyrians are. And so this is a little review, but Israel, the northern kingdom, and Syria, another nation, had formed an alliance to fight off the Assyrians if they were to invade. Well, they wanted Judah, the nation to the south, their brothers to the south, to join in that alliance and have a three-nation alliance. But Judah refused, and we talked about that in previous lessons. Instead, they went to the enemy. They went to the Assyrians and made a pact, ended up becoming a, a nation that had to pay tribute, pay money to the Assyrians to be protected. Well, now, as we're entering this lesson, the Assyrians have already um, invaded and uh, destroyed much of Israel, much of Syria, and so they are marching onward, conquering, and uh, guess who is next? Judah. Judah is next. And so Judah decides that um, the best way to be ready to fight the Assyrians is to make an alliance with Egypt. And of course, if you think about Egypt, you go back to the ten plagues, you go back to the, the Israelites crossing the Red Sea and escaping from the Egyptians. They had 
been previously slaves in Egypt, but now they want to go back to Egypt and get help from Egypt. And in verse 1, we see a very key word. It says, woe. Not woe like stop, but woe, W-O-E. And this would be the opposite of blessed. So in, instead of being blessed, they're going to be cursed because of this. It says, woe to them that go down to Egypt for help. Now, why, what's so wrong about this? Well, what's so wrong about it is back in the book of Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy chapter 17, verse 16, Deuteronomy 17, 16, God had specifically commanded the uh, kings of Israel not to make an alliance with Egypt and not to seek out their horses and chariots. And so this is a direct disobedience of what God has told them in the book of Deuteronomy. If you continue to look in verse 1, you'll see why they turned to Egypt. Because Egypt had lots of horses, lots of chariots, and lots of horsemen. <coughs> the army of Judah was primarily, almost exclusively, formed with foot soldiers. They didn't have the horses, they didn't have the chariots, and so they felt... The only way they could fight the Assyrians was to have the horses, the chariots, and the, uh, the horsemen of Egypt helping them to fight the Assyrians. And you can sort of understand why, because if you imagine a terrible army coming in and all you are able to do is fight on foot, then it could be very overwhelming. But if you have horses where you could go and ride those horses where you needed to be, if you had chariots to be able to move people back and forth, it would make your army much more powerful. And so they looked to Egypt to provide them with that power. However, it was in direct disobedience to what God had already told them to do. He had already told them not to make an alliance with Egypt. And the rest of verse 1 gives us the crux of the matter. It says, But they look not unto the Holy One of Israel, neither seek the Lord. So in their human eyes, in human terms, they looked at their weakness. They looked at the strength of the Egyptian army, and they said, We've got to make an alliance. But notice what they did not do. They did not ask God for his help. They did not ask God for his wisdom or his guidance. And that is the crux of this entire lesson, is where we look to everything else before we ever look to God. I'm going to confess, I do it as well. And, and this lesson to me has been very convicting. Where we look to our own thoughts, we look to the thoughts of others, before we ever turn to God and say, God, I need your help. Our first instinct should always be, God, help me. Even, even when it's a situation that we think we can handle on our own. It should always be, God help me. There is no telling how much better, how much easier our lives could be if we would simply turn to God first instead of last. I hope you'll let that sink in as we continue to look at our verses. In verse 2, God compares himself to the Egyptians. He says, yet he also is wise and will bring evil. Now, this, this word evil, and this occurs several times in the Bible. When it says bring evil, it's not talking about doing evil, but it's talking about disaster or calamity. Often when a natural disaster or, or an 
a war invasion happens, it's called evil. And so that's what this says. He, he also is wise. God is wise. But God can also bring disaster even on your enemies. And he will not call back his words. When God gives us a command, he expects us to obey. When God makes a promise, he expects and will keep it. But he, God, will arise against the house of the evildoers. Well, who are they? Well, certainly Assyria is. Certainly Egypt is because of their sin. But Judah is a house of evildoers because of their disobedience to God. And against the help of them that work iniquity. Now in verse 3 he says, Egyptians are men, not God. Their horses are flesh, not spirit. When the Lord stretches out his hand, those that are helped and those that are helping shall all fall together. So in other words, Egypt shall fall, Assyria will fall, Judah will fall, and all through the power of God. So here we see that, that no matter how powerful, how much help they thought the Egyptians could be, God would be so much greater help. So let's just say Judah feels about this high and they're wanting help. So they turn to the Egyptians who seem this high. But who should they have turned to instead? God, who is this high. The comparison, there is no comparison. The help that Egypt could give cannot even compare to the help that God can give. And that's true in our everyday lives as well. Uh, Right now, we, we are uh, fighting a virus. We're fighting a pandemic. And I'm thankful for the human researchers, for the scientists, the medical professionals, the doctors that are trying to figure this out, that are trying to, f figure, that are trying to figure out a solution to this problem. But where must we turn first? To God. God may have the solution already for us, and he's just waiting for us to get on our knees and ask for that solution. Certainly, he may decide to work through scientists, researchers, medical professionals, but are we turning to them first, or are we turning to God first? Um, I hope that every one of us that we are turning to God and saying, God, help us. Help us through this problem because it is a really big problem. So let's turn to the Lord before we turn to anything else first. Let's go ahead to the next section of Scripture, true faithfulness. Isaiah chapter 31, verses 4 and 5. For thus hath the Lord spoken unto me, like as the lion and the young lion roaring on his prey, when a multitude of shepherds is called forth against him, he will not be afraid of their voice, nor abase himself for the noise of them. So shall the Lord of hosts come down to fight for Mount Zion and for the hill thereof. As birds flying, so will the Lord of hosts defend Jerusalem. Defending also, he will deliver it, and passing over, he will preserve it. This next section of scripture describes the Lord in two different ways, like a lion and also like a mother bird. And so we, we see two different sides of God's protection for his people. In verse 4, we see God compared to a lion and it says that a multitude of shepherds would come out. If a lion was attacking sheep, then a bunch of shepherds would come out and try to make lots of noise and run the lion away. But this says that if a multitude of shepherds, kings, kings from enemy nations, if a multitude of these kings come against God's people, God will not turn and run. He will not be scared, but he will be like a lion to fight on behalf of his people. 
Like as the lion and the young lion roaring on his prey, he will not be afraid of their voice, nor abase himself for the noise of them. What a beautiful picture this next phrase is. So shall the Lord of hosts come down to fight for Mount Zion. Again, Isaiah uses this phrase, the Lord of hosts. And it refers to not just the angelic armies, but even that, that he is the Lord of all the armies of the earth. So God is the commander-in-chief of all the armies, both heavenly and earthly. And he will fight on behalf of his people. And then in verse 5, we see that he's compared to like a bird, a mother bird that's protecting her young. And we know that a, that a mother bird can flit back and forth to try to scare off um, something that's trying to get baby birds. Um, but also a mother bird will spread out her wings and cover the nest to protect her babies. Uh, I want to kind of tell you a funny story. When I was probably, I guess, a college student, maybe a high schooler, I was in my backyard at home in Cedartown, Georgia, and uh, I heard something, and I started looking around, and I saw there was a baby bird um, in, in our backyard. And our backyard had a fenced-in portion, and then, a, then the far backyard was not fenced in. Well, I was in the far backyard, and I saw this baby bird on the ground. And so naturally curious, I, I got closer and closer, and uh, I got close enough that the baby bird started to cheep, probably out of fear of me. But anyway, the baby bird started chirping and cheeping. And the next thing I know, I hear, rawr, rawr. I hear, I hear this mama bird come to attack me. And so from behind, I turn around and there is this, there's this mother bird, a full grown bird coming from behind. And I think it might have been a mocking bird. I can't really remember now, but this, this, it's coming right at me and it's going to come with its with its beak and it's going to come peck me and and it's trying to protect a uh, baby bird and so i just go running well where am i running to i'm running right towards the fence the chain link fence is probably i don't know a good four or five feet tall and so <laughs> As I get to the fence, the, the mama bird is still chasing me. And in one leap, I just leap over the chain link fence and roll into the backyard. And so I've always remembered that mama bird protecting her baby bird. And so God is willing to protect us even more than a mama bird protecting her baby. Uh, here we see true faithfulness. God, truly faithful to fight on behalf of his people. Don't you want God fighting on your behalf? Let's be obedient to him. Let's, let's be pleasing in his sight in the way that we live and just see the mighty ways that he will fight on our behalf. Well, let's go on to the last section of scripture, verses six through nine. This is repentance demonstrated. Starting with verse 6, we're in chapter 31. Turn ye unto him from whom the children of Israel have deeply revolted. For in that day every man shall cast away his idols of silver and his idols of gold, which your own hands have made unto you for a sin. Then shall the Assyrian fall with the sword, not of a mighty man, and the sword, not of a mean man, shall devour him, but he shall flee from the sword, and his young men shall be discomfited. That word means embarrassed. And he shall pass over to his stronghold for fear, and his princes shall be afraid of the ensign, saith the Lord. 
whose fire is in Zion and his furnace in Jerusalem. Well, here we see that Isaiah is calling the people of Judah to repent. He says, turn unto him from whom the children of Israel have deeply revolted. They've rebelled against the Holy One, the God of Israel, the Lord of hosts. They've revolted against him. They've turned to help from someone else instead of from God. And so instead of turning to others for help, turn to God and ask for his help. In the remaining verses, verses 7 through 9, we see several things. We see that the people of Judah had made their own idols of gold and silver, but we see that when they repent, they'll cast those away. They'll see that they're useless, and they are. They're false gods. They have, they have no purpose. They, they have no power. And so they're going to cast those away. Then it says in verse 8 and 9 that the Assyrian will fall with the sword, but not from mighty men. They're going to fall from the sword because God is doing the work. If we look to other places in the Bible, we see in 2 Kings chapter 19 that this does happen. This, this promise that God made that the Assyrians would fall, not because of a mighty army, but because of a mighty God. In 2 Kings 19, we see that in one night, 185,000, that's about three times the population of Dothan, 185,000 Assyrian soldiers die in the night because of the angel of the Lord. And you can read how that all occurs in 2 Kings chapter 19. Of course, we've talked about these prophecies being in the 700s B.C. Well, that event that took place took place in 701 B.C. The Assyrian king, Sennacherib, had invaded all of Judah except for Jerusalem. But God preserved it. God fought for Jerusalem. And in 701 B.C., Jerusalem was saved from the onslaught of the Assyrians. And by almost a hundred years later, in 605 BC, the Assyrian nation, this mighty, terrible, violent nation, was no more. Less than 100 years later, this nation that the people of Judah feared so greatly, and all the other nations did too, by 605 B.C., it was gone, just as God had predicted, just as God had told Isaiah. And we see here that, um, that they are embarrassed, they are defeated in chapter 8. And in verse 9, we see it says, he sh God shall pass over to his stronghold for fear, and his princes shall be afraid of the ensign, the banner, saith the Lord, whose fire is in Zion and his furnace in Jerusalem. This word, Passover, is the same Hebrew word that is used in the book of Exodus, talking about um, how God passed, or how the angel of the Lord passed over all the Israelite homes that had the blood on the doorpost. So here we see God passing over in a mighty way once again to defend his people, to protect his people. Um, I kind of want to summarize all this with a, a, another little funny thing. I remember a number of years ago um, driving through Birmingham and seeing a billboard it was an advertisement for a plumbing company. And you may have seen it. I think it's been there for a long time. And I can't remember exactly what it says, but I'll definitely give you the gist of it. 
the, uh, the plumber's advertisement says that we'll fix what your husband tore up. Uh, or in other words, we'll fix what your husband thought he could fix. So the idea is we're the rescue, that we are the plumbers that will come in and fix what your husband thought he could fix, but he ended up just tearing it up. Well, so often we turn to we turn to other people, we turn to our own thoughts and intellect, we turn to many, many things besides God. And just like the husband thinks he can fix the plumbing problem, it really needed a professional. It needed a plumber to come in and, and fix this problem. Well, in our lives, so often we turn to anybody and anything to try to fix our problems when we need to go to the professional to the one that we know can fix it, to the one that we know can help us, to the one that we know can protect us, and that's the Lord. God is great, and God is good. Why don't we turn to him when we need help? Let's pray together. Dear God, we acknowledge your greatness. We acknowledge your goodness. And Lord, I confess to you my sin of turning to so many other solutions besides turning to you. And Lord, I suspect that others that are watching have done the same thing. Lord, please forgive us. Help us to repent like Isaiah called us to do and to turn to you for help. Lord, we are battling a virus that is killing people. Lord, we're battling so many other problems in our society, and we need your touch. We need your help. We need your wisdom. We need your guidance. Dear God, please help us. Please help our health situation. Please help the sin that's in our land. Lord, we pray that you'll help us as Christians to be the godly men and women that we need to be. And help us to not be silent, but to share your glory, to share your salvation with so many that are lost. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, I've enjoyed so much being with you today. Thank you so much for joining us. If you're able, we would love to see you here at the church. Um, we miss every single one that's not able to be here. And I hope that you are staying healthy and safe. And uh, we look forward to seeing you just as soon as we possibly can. Uh, of course, later this morning, we'll be having our worship service at 10 a.m. If you can join us, we sure hope that you will. And I hope you have a great week. We love you so much. And we hope that you have a wonderful week. And uh, we'll see you again soon.